Hello, listeners. It's Mallory Wilsey, chief producer of the Enrollify Network, and I want to take just a moment to tell you about another show on Enrollify that I know you'll love. Mastering the Next is a cutting-edge podcast exploring the future of graduate, online, and non-traditional education through the lens of technology and artificial intelligence. Staying competitive in the world of graduate student recruitment and enrollment means keeping up with the ever-evolving tech trends in higher ed. Join Dr. Ray Lutsky, VP of Strategic Partnerships at Element 451, as he explores what's next at the dynamic intersection of student recruitment and leading-edge technology. Each episode will explore future trends and the technology shaping the academic landscape of the 21st century. Listeners will be equipped with strategies to meet the evolving needs of today's online and non-traditional learners. New episodes drop every other Friday, and you can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search Mastering the Next wherever you get your podcasts. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about! Wait! Okay now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome to Learning from Leaders, a special five-part Pulse Check series on leadership and management brought to you by Enrollify and Element 451. I'm Dr. Carrie Phillips, Chief Communications and Marketing Officer at UA Little Rock. My goal is to help aspiring leaders step into their next role with confidence. So over the next five weeks, you'll hear candid conversations with successful higher education leaders who share their personal journeys, lessons learned, and practical advice on a variety of topics, ranging from managing teams and overseeing budgets to setting vision and building campus collaboration. Now, let's jump into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome so much to this episode of Learning from Leaders. This is the go-to place for the next generation of Marcom leaders looking to sharpen their skills and navigate the complex world of marketing and communications in higher education. I'm Carrie Phillips, and today we have a topic that many will find probably a little daunting, but really crucial for growth and leadership. That's having tough conversations. And joining us today is Rebecca Tilly, a leader in the field of marketing and communications. And prior to her current role as AVP of Communications and Marketing at the Iowa Center for Advancement, she led communication strategy, including social media, at the award-winning Tipping Collie of Business at the University of Iowa. So it's easy to see that she has a wealth of knowledge and experience on this topic and helping us navigate those challenging dialogues. So Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so great to be here and discussing a topic that I think isn't always covered when you think about leadership development. You are absolutely right. And so I want to get right into it. You know, as we think about tough conversations, you know, there are things many of us probably try to avoid. Can you talk us through maybe a defining moment in your career when you had to navigate a tough conversation and what were some takeaways from that experience? Yeah. You know, to be honest, I've had so many of these conversations now in my career that it's hard to pick one that reaches the level of defining. I did have a moment a few years ago when I realized my positionality had changed in these conversations, if that makes sense. So, you know, early in your career, you're often on the receiving end of these conversations, unless you're just exceptionally mature and learned early on how to initiate tough conversations with colleagues. You know, and in this particular case, I had set up a meeting for a challenging conversation with a colleague outside my team because, and because of, you know, funky higher ed structures, it felt to me I was addressing someone above me in the org chart, but it became really clear to me that that person didn't receive it that way. I think they felt like they were getting called into the principal's office because of where I sat. I was a member of the leadership team and, you know, and I think I realized, oh, we're both approaching from this conversation with a lot of defensive fear. And when I realized that I was able to change up my approach. And I think you hit on something there, and that's the notion of of fear. You know, I think fear plays a major part in how we approach these conversations, how people receive information in them. So what are some of the fears that you've observed? And then how do we, as rising leaders, learn to channel that and handle that within the conversation? First and foremost, we're afraid of that person's reaction, right? Like, how are they going to respond to us when we bring up this thing? We're afraid... We might make the situation worse. 
And, and I think most terrifying for those of us that are, or as a, you know, the oracle of our time, Taylor Swift puts it, are pathological people pleasers. What happens if you become the villain in somebody else's story? That's really scary. So, you know, and I inherited from my family of origin an extreme conflict avoidance. And so none of this comes naturally to me in any capacity. Like I've ha really had to learn through a lot of failure that, you know, it's time consuming and it's largely ineffective to try to socially engineer around conflict. Like that's something that took me a long time to learn. But I've also been on the receiving end of un unaddressed conflict. So, you know, if a colleague is unwilling to talk through like what they're unhappy yeah. about with you and how very unsettling that is. And, mm -hmm. you know, and those, those, the environment that creates um, is, is really negative ultimately. Like it, you don't have psychological safety and you can't do great creative work if you're working in those environments. And so it's critical to doing the work well to have these conversations. So first off, I'm loving the Taylor Swift reference. So let's start with that. <laughs> um, but I think you hit on something, you know, for a lot of people, this is not something that they're naturally good at. It's something that they've had to, you know, work at, learn, put some thoughts behind. So for those future leaders who are watching, especially those folks who say, I'm not good at this, this is not in my wheelhouse, what strategies have you used to help you, you know, keep those outside influences in check when you're needing to really have those conversations? Yeah. Is it basically like, how do I psych myself yeah. up for these conversations? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for me, I've discovered that I hesitate a lot less when I'm sticking up for some other member of my team, if that makes mm, sense, where okay. it's hard for me to stick up for myself. But if I'm sticking up for someone else on my team, I find that it's easier to kind of get there. It's easier to motivate myself. You know, I want every member of my team to be treated with respect throughout throughout our organization and, and it's my job to reinforce that when that's needed right so that's that's what they pay me the money for so i do think it's much harder to address performance concerns kind of within the team and i think of my role as a supervisor as chief advocate for my employee and so you know for a long time giving performance feedback felt bad like it didn't feel I was advocating for my employees, but then I, it took me a minute to realize like, no, these are the things that it is advocacy for your employee because you're, you're giving them feedback that allows them to get better. And I think, you know, it helps me to think of examples of how, you know, being empathetic, but direct has led to some really positive outcomes, like addressing, for example, untreated mental illness. Sometimes the reason people are struggling is because of things like that. And then these are the wake up calls they need to actually go seek out help. I think you hit on something important there too, that, you know, it's really part of that is how you frame it, that these are important conversations for team growth, for personal development. So can you talk through your perspective, why those conversations are really critical to help your team continue to grow in advance? Um, you know, I've worked in many different environments, both positive and negative, but, you know, over my career in higher ed. And, you know, while I think there are many challenging things about being a leader, <laughs> One of the incredible awesome things is you get to set the standards that create the environment that you want to work in, right? And so challenging conversations are part of how you set those standards and create that environment. And I think too, you know, sometimes we put into our own mind this almost self-fulfilling prophecy that this is going to be a terrible thing. It's going to be the most awful conversation. It's going to end badly. And so we set ourselves up for that kind of outcome, but this, that isn't always the case. You know, sometimes these conversations can have a really positive outcome. And so can you, you know, without getting into specifics, talk about a time that you had to have, you know, one of those difficult conversations and how it positively led to outcomes for you or the team? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, definitely going to be a little vague book here <laughs> because again, you know, you want to be sensitive and confidential about some of these things. Absolutely. So, um, I did have a situation a couple of years ago where I could sense that I had somehow soured a relationship with an entire team of people that I had previously had a really good rapport with. And so, you know, to the credit of the leader of this team, they actually, he actually called or, or they called me in and asked and laid out kind of all the reasons why this team was kind of really frustrated with me. And to be honest, this was like a top three worst professional moment of my life. Like I remember leaving that conversation and I literally sobbed all the way back to walking from my office to the car because I was just it was so devastated um, to receive this news and you know and if the story ended right there it wouldn't be much of a success story right it would have been someone gave me a piece of information that devastated me and then I felt terrible about it and and that was the end right and so right. but 
I scheduled a follow-up meeting with that leader and I talked through each of the issues that they had brought up thoroughly and you know, and especially when neither one of us were quite as emotional, like they were less frustrated, I was less hurt. And, and while healing didn't happen overnight, and I think this is an important thing to realize, it's not like you're going to walk into a situation, have a hard conversation and leave, like everything's hunky-dory. It was a really important step toward what later became a very strong working relationship that has persisted to this day. And I think that's an important thing to think about as you're a leader, you know, thinking about this and having these tough conversations, you have to be able to, you know, sometimes take that step back, pause the emotion and come back to the conversation and continue it over time. That can be really hard to do sometimes too, because sometimes you just like, I want to address it and I want to be it done and then, call, you know, check it off my list, right? And right. so, and that's just not how human relationships work. So in making sure that today's conversation is really actionable, can you talk through for our listeners how you prepare to have that difficult conversation? Maybe that's with an employee, a member of your team, a colleague on campus. How do you kind of approach that and get organized to have that conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing I do is I, I sort of talk through the situation with a trusted and confidential guide, right? So, um, Obviously, as leaders, we need to be very sensitive to, you know, how we're talking about our direct reports to people who might also work with them. And so for me, this ends up being someone either like on our human resources team or to be honest, like sometimes I talk things through with my spouse because I trust I trust him to help me be as self-reflective, fair and compassionate as possible because he's somebody who knows my my flaws and, and will and will say, like, I think you're being unfair here or. Like, are you giving this person the benefit of the doubt or are you assuming intentions right here? Like he's, I I trust him explicitly with things like that. So, so that's one. Um, The second would be practice. (laughs) I'm a big, I'm a big, I I feel more comfortable in situations where I've had an opportunity to sort of talk things through. Um, And, you know, my preparation for challenging conversations will sometimes mirror how I'll prepare to give like a conference talk or something like that. You know, I'll write down my main points but then I'll actually practice saying it out loud. And then sometimes this exercise for me actually helps me find better ways of expressing myself than if I try to write it out, if that makes sense. Yeah. But you kind of have to figure out what works for you. So, and, but that's, that's one thing I do. And then the third thing is um, I exercise. (laughs) So like I, it's natural to become like really anxious when you're preparing Mm -hmm. for these conversations, especially like if you're like me, who's, you know, trying to overcome becoming conflict avoidant. And my favorite way to relieve stress is to move my body in some kind of way. So, you know, I'm a runner. So usually in the day leading up to the challenging conversation, I run a lot more than I would normally do. But I mean, even if it's just like going outside and walking around in a circle and being in some sunshine or something like that, anything you need to do to kind of take care of yourself and prepare yourself to then bring your best self to that conversation. I had a conversation with somebody recently, and I think that idea of talking through that confidential, you know, advisor role and how important having a strong mentor can be in that to give you somebody that can be that sounding board to make sure you're thinking about that. And I think one of the things for me is I don't act so dissimilar than you in that I practice all of this. But then sometimes when that person is is sitting across the table from me and like we're having the conversation, I sometimes figure out how do I start? Like, where do I start? And so I'm curious if there's anything that you can kind of give a, should you have an icebreaker? Should you not? Like, how do you approach the the moment is here? How do we actually begin that conversation? Right. Hey, it's Mallory. Exciting news. I'm hosting the Engage Summit in Raleigh on June 25th and 26th, and I'd love to meet you there. Together, we'll dive into the mind of the modern student what fires them up, how they interact, and what they expect in today's digital age, and how tools like AI help put them in the driver's seat of their education. We have some terrific speakers, including our closing keynote, New York Times bestselling author Jeff Salingo. Sessions will dig into practical ideas and innovative strategies to get your team more student-centered and ready to adopt AI. And many of your favorite Enrollify hosts are presenting too, like Jamie Hunt, Jenny Lee Fowler, and Brian Gross. Use the discount code ENROLLIFY50 for an extra $50 off your registration. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. We can't wait to see you there. 
you know, as I reflect on this, I think I, I really start these conversations one of two ways. You know, the first is sometimes I'll reference the overarching principle or goal that I'm trying to reinforce by having the conversation in the first place. You know, so for things like, you know, for us to, for us to have a thriving creative environment and do our best work, it's really important for us to be thoughtful about how we engage with our colleagues. I've noticed blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, um, it's really important to me that we provide the best customer service possible for our internal partners and treat with them with the respect that we want to be treated with. And yesterday in a meeting, I noticed that blah, 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 <laughs> you know, something along those lines. But so and then the second approach is I'll start describing to the person my understanding of their take on the conflict Ooh, okay. to to ensure that I fully understand their perspective. It's a little bit of that active listening thing going on. And this sort of helps kick off the discussion with a shared understanding of the issue. So, you know, it might look something like, you know, I understand that you were expecting X to happen and a member of my team did not deliver X to you on the time frame you were expecting. And then give them an opportunity to affirm or deny that just to, you know, clear the field and make sure that everything's on the up and up. And I would love to hear, because part of this is also, you know, as leaders, we talk about needing to manage the whole person and needing to support the entire person. And so, especially sometimes in performance feedback, when we're having to give that, how do we balance that need of getting the work and getting the things done in a certain way with also the human side? And how do we, you know, balance that empathy piece in the middle of sometimes what are really tough and hard conversations? Right. I would hope, too, that, you know, all of these things, conversations are happening within a context. Right. And so hopefully you've you've established care and empathy for your whoever you're talking to before you're kind of engaging on these things. But I do think also you need to have enough self-awareness to know kind of what side you're most likely to fall prey to. So given my background, I have to be I really have to guard against being unclear and not Mm. firm because I'm worried about being unlikable. Right. So that's something I found many examples of where I think I've expressed something clearly to somebody, but it's become clear later that because I've, I've softened it and talked around it in such a way that they don't understand what I've said. And it's not until I've said, okay, here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. And they're like, oh, okay, now I understand. (laughs) Right. So we just, um, and that said, I will say that it's helped with many conversations, um, when I directly empathize with the person that I'm talking to, I mean, these are kind of things that you can decide whether it makes sense to employ or not employ. But, you know, one time I was about to have a a tough conversation with a colleague about how they had treated one of my employees. And so based on their character, I decided the tactic I was going to take was to be very vulnerable with them. Right. And, and so to just to underscore how inappropriate their actions were, I told a story about a time where, I had behaved in a way where I had been triggered in a certain kind of way. I behaved in a certain kind of way and then ultimately wasn't the best thing to do. And and the way that I kind of couched it to her, I was like, you know, in that moment, I felt 100% justified in saying what I said, but it was also 100% inappropriate, right? And, And so then that story laid the groundwork for me to make the point that I recognized and understood you know, that my colleague felt 100% justified in the actions that she had taken toward my employees, but also underscore that, you know, what she did was 100% inappropriate. And I think that vulnerability in the moment communicated that I wasn't above making mistakes myself. Yeah. And that helped soften things and allow her to recognize, oh, I see what you're saying. And I, you know, on reflection, I agree. And so thinking about, okay, you've had the tough conversation, you've kind of had that initial, here's where we are. So talk a little bit about the follow-up because you've said, you know, this isn't just happens once and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Like talk about what that cadence looks like or how often do you find is helpful to revisit that conversation? I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah. You do have to hold people accountable. Yep. And oftentimes these are not one and done conversations, which to be honest, I feel, I always find kind of frustrating because I'm just like, what do you mean? We didn't just talk about this one time and it solved everything, right? <laughs> like you have to, you do kind of constantly have to revisit, revisit those things sometimes. And the way that I sort of tackle it is, um, you know, if I see things that they're, if they have received feedback and they're making changes positively, I try to acknowledge that. Like, I see that you're working on this and this and this, and, you know, thank you for taking that feedback to heart. Or if it's, they're not quite meeting, you know, meeting the expectations I laid out. I can say things like, I see here and here how you're working really hard on this particular thing, but 
we still need to work on this and this and just be as those things come up, you know, in regular touch bases or things like that, just to constantly kind of reinforce and, and keep those going. So you have, over the span of your career, have certainly have had to deal with this in different ways in different places. But I can't imagine that as you've moved from being the person that's been on the receiving end to now being the person that's somewhat leading this, what are some of the lessons that you've learned that have helped you be better at these conversations? One of the best is definitely don't assume intentions. Like I I constantly have to tell myself that over and over again, because it's really easy for us to whether we intend to or not demonize people a little bit, like we're like, the reason they're doing that is because of this. And, you know, and just, it's easier for us to kind of devolve and to be being really black and white thinkers about stuff. And I do feel like this is where my spouse really shines. He'll be the first to push back when I'm assuming intentions. And so I appreciate that about him a lot. Um, The other piece I think is too, and kind of relatedly, you know, lead with curiosity, right? Like, like I'm noticing these things. Can you explain to me like what's going on here? Because sometimes the answer is really surprising. Like it's sometimes it's um, completely in a place that you wouldn't expect. And then that would change up the way you're approached, I think. And I think that's really important as well. And so thinking about that, what kind of final advice would you give to up and coming Marcom leaders who they're maybe new in a leadership role and they're about to really face that first tough conversation? What would you tell them? Yeah, probably the first thing is I think you really have to acknowledge and make space for what can be really heavy emotional labor, right? Like this, this work is, is, is very taxing on you personally. And these are times when you have to lean really hard into practices that allow you to continue to bring your best self to work. You know, when I'm stressed and nothing stresses me out, like these kinds of conversations, it's easy to reach for negative coping mechanisms rather than positive ones, right? So nutritious food, sleep enough, drink enough water, move your body. You know, those are the things that allow you to show up and continue to set the positive tone for your team. And counterintuitively, those are the things that we want to ditch, you know, when things get really tough. And then the other thing I would say too is, um, you know, this is just sort of the kind of person that I am, but I do try to be pretty transparent about how, in fact, I had a colleague come to my door yesterday and she's like, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'll be honest, I'm grouchy. right? So, (laughs) And I'm trying really hard not to take it out on anybody else right now. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, whatever. And, but, um, you know, I, I do try to be, you know, transparent when appropriate, but you know, there are other times when you just like, you gotta, you gotta suck it in and you just gotta like put that positive face out there in the world. And then, but then go home and really take care of yourself. One of my favorite phrases is how's the weather between your ears because it yeah. gives everybody this ability to use similar language to kind of talk about what they're feeling because there's something about we just naturally tend to say, oh, I'm good or things are fine. Like So it gives yeah. us something that we can respond to with that. Right. No, I love that. That's so great. <laughs> so this has been a wonderful conversation and really enlightening as we talk about the necessity of these, but also the the art of doing this work and doing it really well. So thank you to Rebecca so much for joining us. Your insights and experiences are so valuable to help our up and coming Marcom leaders prepare for navigating these conversations. So thank you again for sharing your wisdom with us. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Carrie. You're so sweet. And I, I just admire you so much. So thank you for this. Well, thank you. And to our listeners, thank you as well for tuning in. Remember that the path to effective leadership involves open, honest, and sometimes those tough conversations. But we're all better for having those. Until next time, keep learning and leading. This Pulse Check mini-series has been brought to you by Pathify. Gone are the days of clunky interfaces, disjointed systems, and massive, unhelpful link farms. Centralize all your systems with Pathify so that students see the information that matters to them in a digital experience that actually makes sense. From prospective students through alumni, it's about time the student experience started looking and acting like a consumer app from this century. Visit pathify.com for more. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.